So if you if you have anything that you have that you're suffering with, you want to look at toxins because they're so inflammatory at their nature and inflammation breeds breeds breakdown. And you're going to show up with your breakdown in the way that your body is prone to. So again, I did autoimmune. My husband does diabetes. Your family maybe do something else. So you're going to go down that, that toxins pathway, whatever you're prone to, you know, your, your manifestation. Mm -hmm. So when you look at immune function, toxins are absolutely playing a role because this constant unremitting exposure challenges the immune system and then it gets less efficient and then we get sick more often. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and today I am interviewing Dr. Wendy Trebeau. She is a medical doctor and an IFM certified practitioner. She's passionate about helping women optimize their health and lives as a functional medicine gynecologist. And through her own struggles with mold and metal toxicity, celiac disease, and other health issues, she's developed a deep sense of compassion and expertise for what her patients are facing. This is going to be an amazing conversation today, all about toxins. She's the co-author of Dirty Girl, Ditch the Toxins, Look Great, and Feel Freaking Amazing. And she's been regularly featured in Mind Body Green. And her next book on how to gracefully transition from your reproductive years into menopause comes out in 2024. So she gave me permission to call her Wendy throughout this interview. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today, all about toxins and optimizing our health. So let's just kick it off with who you are, uh, how you got into medicine, and then more specifically, how you transition into functional medicine. Um, and the importance of that for your journey. Sure. That was a lot of questions. So if I forget something, let me know, Morgan. And thanks for having me on. This will be great. Um, (laughs) I actually swore I would never go into medicine. I come from a long line of physicians and I was like, no way. No, 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 no. X never. And then I went, graduated college with a degree in psychology and went into sales because that's what you did in the 80s. You go into sales. So I went into sales and a lot of my clients kept asking me medical questions like, Mm -hmm. Hey, Wendy, blah, 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 blah. And I I was like, you know, I'm your 22 year old rep uh, for video, video and audio video and slides. And they're like, I know, but you just seem like you would know. So I'm asking you like, okay, I'm clearly the medical information booth. So I went to med school and, uh, Fast forward, I swore I would never go into OB because my dad's an OB. And I was like, no way, no how. So of course, what do I do? I go into OB. And uh, fast forward again to I'm now in OB. I've been attending. It's 2005. So I've been an attending for a little over a year. And I'm. um, it's now 2006, actually. And I'm delivering my second child. And I am sick. Morgan, I'm like, I can barely get out of bed every day. Head to toe. Something's wrong. So my hair was thinning. I had brain fog. I had anxiety. I had heart palpitations. I had thyroid dysfunction. I had asthma. I had bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, sometimes on the same day, right? Like you get what you get. It was all, it was always something new. Uh, I had bad periods. I had challenges with fertility. I had mineral and nutrient deficiencies and I was wasting. I was very, very thin. And I was very sick. And I got out of bed every day because I was the primary breadwinner at the time. And I really only got out of bed because I had to. And my, I was delivering our second child. And my husband said to me, hey, before our insurance changes, why don't you see my mentor? And I was like, okay. He was working. He had met his mentor at some conference and was shadowing him once a week. He was a local Boston functional medicine doctor. So I was like, okay. So he, I go to him and this is my first foray into functional medicine. I've really never heard of functional medicine. I just right. knew I felt terrible. And he does this huge workup, or at the time I considered it to be a huge workup. Now I'm like, that's child's play. There's so much more we can do, right? But it was like a huge workup for me. And I remember the car ride up. I'm now six weeks postpartum and we're mm-hmm. in the car. And I was like, honey, you got to call him. He's like, we're on our way there. I'm like, I can't wait another minute. You know, postpartum pregnant women and women who are nursing and women who are sleep deprived are not always in their right minds, right? So the best response is to just say yes, dear, and move on, right? So he calls his mentor and he's like, I'm really sorry to bother you. Wendy's losing her mind. What's wrong with her? 
And we're on the phone. He's on speaker. And he says, she's not going to like it. I'm like, oh my God, do I have diabetes? Please don't tell me I have diabetes. Like, please, 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 please. Like, I can't do it. They, this is before continuous glucose monitors. This is before the thigh samplers. And you had to prick your fingers. I'm like, I'm never, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's sacred space. He goes, no, you don't have diabetes. You have celiac. And mm. I went, oh, my dad has celiac. And he goes, yeah, it's genetic. You should have been tested. And I, I said to my dad, dad, it's genetic. I should have been tested. He's like, didn't I tell you to test? I'm like, no. So my dad had been diagnosed about 10 years before. And then I got diagnosed. So and my dad got diagnosed because he had osteoporosis and broke a hip and 50 year old men do not break their hips. That's just not how it goes. Yeah. So that was my entry into functional medicine. I was a full fledged OBGYN at the time, delivering babies, doing surgery, office care, you know, it was a full gamut. And that was that that was a diagnosis that really altered my life because I I was able to resolve and reverse almost all of those issues. And I still am prone to nutrient deficiencies because my gut for so many years, it was like 20 years, Morgan, that I wasn't diagnosed. So my gut still doesn't absorb the best. So I flood the pump. I take a lot of supplements so that I eventually absorb it. But fast forward, my husband then opened up a functional medicine office, like literally two blocks from where I was practicing. And I would send him all of my, oh my God, you're here in my office. I can't do anything for you again patients, like all those people, I was like, I can't help you. Why don't you go see my husband? Right. And uh, it got to that point where one day I was like, I really need to be doing what he's doing Mm -hmm. because I had outgrown the tools in my toolbox. And what I'll say is if you need, if you need mainstream care, like you have an emergency, you need surgery, you need to deliver a baby and you need to be in a hospital setting, you really do need mainstream medicine. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's, there's a place on the board for that. But if you are looking for optimal wellness, longevity, peak performance, getting underneath and fixing the cause of the issues you have, you need functional medicine. Mm -hmm. It's just a different use of the tools, different Mm -hmm. tools too. So I left and I went into functional medicine in 2009. Um, It was like a leap of faith because he had just opened up. It was, uh, you know, those moments where you wake up. I didn't know I was pregnant. So I wake up in the morning on my high school reunion weekend you know, we get together every every year or two with for my high school. We're all a bunch of townies, right? So we all get together. And um, I said to them, I'm leaving my job on Monday. I'm going to go work in my husband's new place. And they're like, cool. Okay, Monday comes. I give notice. I give 90 days because that's the requirement. And then Tuesday morning, I realize I'm pregnant. And that it was probably this human inside me who was super grounded and focused that gave me the like, sort of impetus to do it. So I was like, what have I done? Right. I'm leaving my not cushy, but paid job with good insurance for my unpaid job where there's no insurance. Yeah. Like, what have I done? Right. And it always works out. So it worked out and I went into functional medicine and that was 2009. And so that was 14 years ago. And I've been successively developing my skills ever since, right? I started with gut health because that was what was pertinent. And then I moved into thyroid and adrenals. And then I moved into all all of the women's care and reversing endometriosis and um, menopausal transition issues and everything, fertility challenges. And then I expanded into toxins when it got personal because that's the first story I told you was hump one. Mm -hmm. And the second part of the story is hump two. But let me pause because like, I just dumped a lot on you. No, I'm following completely. Nope. I would love to hear. I mean, I have some questions, but I feel like you might answer them when you talk about hump two. So hump one is celiac disease. Yep. Undercut, like discovering that, discovering how to heal yourself, transitioning from uh, traditional Western train to functional. So what was hump two? Hump two was torture. So uh, I had worked on my health a lot from the moment I got that celiac diagnosis, I was 35 and I worked on my health like crazy. Like I walk the talk. We, you know, we're all organic. We have a garden. I exercise. I didn't get enough sleep, but I didn't know it actually Mm. worked on my stress, you know, all the, all the right things. Right. So I'm, we're, I'm 48 at the time and we go on this amazing vacation to France and we spend a week in France and then we go to, to London. And the month after I came home, so it wasn't while I was in France or London, it was the month after I gained nine pounds 
and my hair just came out in clumps, like clump, crazy clumps. And I had this rash on my face, like Morgan, I wanted to rip my face off because like the corners of my eyes and then right around my nose and under my lip. And it was so itchy. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what does every human say when they gain weight and lose hair? Every human is like, my thyroid must be off. So Mm -hmm. I'm human. And I was like, my thyroid must be off. So I check my thyroid. It's never been better. Remember I said I had thyroid dysfunction from celiac, but I've healed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I'm 48. So then my next thought is it must be hormonal. So I check my hormones and they're perfect. Okay. As a functional medicine provider, we know all disease starts in the gut. So then I do a stool test. Yes, it's poop. It's super unpleasant, but I do a stool test. And my gut looks really darn good, especially for a celiac who's had longstanding inflammation and dysfunction. It looked really good. Now I'm really stumped. And I'm just kind of flailing around for a few months. And and one day I hear this report that when Notre Dame burned, it released 500 tons of lead dust into the air. And the closer you were to Notre Dame in Paris, the more exposure you got. And then, of course, the farther away you got, the less you got. Guess what? Our week in Paris was right after Notre Dame burned. And we spent a week right there slogging through the dust. I remember being like, oh, man, we're so dusty. I'm going to have to wash everything. I remember saying that. And I, I looked at my husband. I was like, oh, my God, I got a lead exposure. We all got a lead exposure, but I'm sick. So I did my lead testing. That's the benefit of working in a functional medicine office. So I didn't have access to all the testing. So I did the testing. I had already completed the mycotoxins testing. That's testing for what toxins are mold putting out that are inside you. That's called mycotoxins. And I had five strains, five strains, man. I mean, like just, I'm sort of like this loyal repository for all these toxins Okay. So I do my lead testing and, you know, because I've had these tests before, I knew that I was slightly positive for lead, but at the time, what I didn't know that I know now is that it's often an underestimation of what's really there because the, the, the same thing that puts you at risk for having crappy detox has you not show it, right? You're storing it in your body. You have to ramp up the detox. It's just harder to see. So what you see is not really what you're getting. So I had blown it off. Bad me. I'll never do it again, but I didn't know. So I retest and my lead levels are 25% higher than they were. And now they're really positive. And I was like, oh, I got a lead exposure. And then I was like, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'll just do all the testing. And I did the glyphosate, the gasoline fumes, nail polish, phthalates, plastics, styrene, VOCs, flame returns is a whole 17 page report. And I did that. And I was positive for like half the, half the report was positive. So I looked at my husband and I went, I'm such a dirty girl. <laughs> and I went, okay, that's the book we're writing. Uh-huh. Because I've spent the last now 17 years focusing on my health and, and being a good example for people. And if I have all of this, what does everyone else have who right. might not really even know where to look and what to do? So we wrote this as a, we wrote the book as a roadmap to educate people and to give them an opportunity to level up because there's so much that you can do on your own. And of course, if you really want to do dive in, you need a functional medicine provider, but mm-hmm. there's 80% you can do before you get to them. So we wrote the book as a roadmap, but that was the impetus for writing the book because I was so messy. I was so messy, you know, like I just, and I was back to kind of when I, before the celiac diagnosis where like I could barely get out of bed, I had fatigue and brain fog. And I was like, oh man, again, menopause stinks. Right. But it wasn't menopause. It was toxins. Mm -hmm. It was toxins. I've, I've interviewed another functional doctor, Dr. Kozlowski, and he describes it as a bucket and where we have like a stress bucket and you evidently had some stressors already in your bucket. And then you went to Paris and had the pretty big lead exposure. So do you think that that's kind of what made your toxin bucket spill over and then you had symptoms of, of what you're experiencing. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, look, if you look back at it, so I have terrible genes, but genes is only like 10 to 15% of the story of the narrative. Mm -hmm. So I have terrible genes that sets the stage, but then I had nutrient deficiencies when I was 15 to 35 and you know, we just didn't know what we knew now, what, what yeah. then, what we knew now. And I didn't just go to medicine. I went into OBGYN where I was sleep deprived. The stakes are high. It's babies. You're up all night. That did not help. 
Mm-hmm. And then I had four children. I love and adore my children. And I was pregnant or nursing for 11 years. And so that is its own level of stress. And then we had our own business. We're entrepreneurs. That's its own level of stress. So you just start to pile it on, right? So yes, absolutely. By the time I got to that lead exposure, I had piled on in a crazy way and no longer had any any elasticity in my rubber band, right? I had no more resiliency to kind of absorb it. And, and you know that I was already challenged when I had the autoimmune disease, the celiac diagnosis, yeah. but I didn't think of it like that at that point, even though I knew about the rain barrel and it was full and blah, blah, blah. I didn't really think like, oh, one autoimmune disease means your rain barrel is overflowing. Mm-hmm. No, and I think a lot of people don't. I think it's so interesting because these are invisible to the na- the naked eye. The mm-hmm. symptoms are visible. The symptoms are palpable, yeah. but the toxins you don't really just see it. You know, you don't see these microplastics and all. You know, the lead and the in the dust. You just, it's just something that you. I think it's so beautiful that this happened to you. I don't mean that in a bad way, but you're the no. you're the perfect person for it to happen to because then you can turn it into a book and educate so many other people on your experience to help them and, you know, empower themselves to improve their own health. So Mm -hmm. one interesting thing, I think that's a beautiful segue into this conversation. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, better you than, um, I think anyone else, like I said, because I think you're the right person to internalize that and really think about it and solve the problem. So kudos to you for solving the problem. Um, so how do these environmental toxins affect our immunity? So we talked a little bit about health, but I thought that was really interesting that we haven't talked about yet is how does it affect our immunity? Yeah. In so many ways, Morgan. So this is, it, this sounds like a really simple question. I know, but it's not. Yeah. And it's one of those, it's one of those like, you know, entry level questions where you go, wow, this is much more extensive than you would think. So, so toxins are in, inherently inflammatory. The system does not like them. The system tries to get rid of them or sequester them. And what I mean by sequester is either you're going to process it. There's three main excretion pathways. Your liver is the biggest one. Well, maybe four. Your liver, your gut, and your your urine, and then your breath. So there's four main excretion pathways. And then I would call your skin your fifth because you can sweat out Mm -hmm. your toxins. But in order to sweat them out, they have to be water soluble. And most toxins are fat soluble. So you have to take them from fat soluble inflammatory in in the liver. There's two phases. Phase one takes them from being fat soluble and inflammatory to fat soluble and intermediate, even more inflammatory. It's called a toxic free radical. Mm -hmm. Now, most people are pretty quick at phase one. You You know, you're like, whoa, problem. Let's get rid of it. So you're very quick at starting the process, but we're not as fast in phase two, which is the part where you take that toxic intermediate and in some way you bind it. So it's inert and it's water soluble. So the goal and, and it's inert right? So you want it to get out of you. So once you have that, you can then either pee, poop, sweat, breathe. Um, What did I miss? No, that's it. Pee, poop, sweat, or breathe. So you can get that out of your body in some way, because those are all water soluble modalities, right? Your poop is water, your pee is water, your sweat's water, your breath is just air, but there's water droplets. So what happens is if you can't get rid of it, now you have either you can't, you have too much coming at you, Remember like Lucille Ball and her and Ethel when they're at the chocolate factory and they're trying to wrap the chocolates and at first they're okay. And then the assembly line comes faster and faster and they can't keep up with the chocolates. And that's what's happening in our body. We are being deluged with, unfortunately, not chocolate, not like sunshine and rainbows. We're being deluged with toxic intermediates, toxic toxins, endocrine disruptors, plastic phthalates, VOCs, metals, whatever. And what happens is if you can't deal with them, they, they then get stored in your fat and they, they're inflammatory in that case, but they're also inflammatory on the process to getting stored. So toxins in and of themselves can alter your gut function, can uh, cause, uh, sorry, organ damage, can alter your immune function, can alter your resistance to sugar, you know, cause you to be insulin resistant. It intrinsically causes dysfunction in the system, dysfunction junction, right? Like we're all back in elementary school. So think of it like 
when you have something that's super inflammatory, it causes stress on the system. And that stress leads to the immune system not functioning as well. Because mm-hmm. stressors ultimately, you can have a boost in your immune system if it's short and sweet. But if it goes on for a while, it does become an immune challenge. The immune system goes down. That's why a lot of people will be like, oh, I was so stressed. And then I got sick when the stress went away, right? Because right. your immune system was low. All the time. Exactly. I, exactly. I, I mean, all the time. My mom, especially, she'll go like hard, you know, mm-hmm. just taking care of someone, taking care of someone else. And then she gets home and she comes down with something every time. Or another great example is caregivers. So, um, a husband, wife aging, one is taking care of the other and then one passes away and the caregiver just crashes, Mm -hmm. just totally crashes. I think that's another really pertinent example here. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned, we, you, you said that it can contribute to blood sugar dysregulation a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is that because it alters the cells of like the pancreas or because it causes insulin resistance and like fat cells or, you know, any more specifics that you wanted to add there for insulin resistance or weight loss resistance? Yeah. It, the way you want to think about it is it's the inflammation issue. Mm -hmm. So the, so you're going to, you're going to walk down your path. And so a huge number of people walk down insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, elevated uh, hyperglycemia, and and ultimately type two diabetes, a large number of people, when the system gets dysfunctional, they're going to walk down that path. There's not that many paths you can walk down Morgan. I mean, there's lots of diseases, but when you look into it, there's autoimmune, there's degenerative, there's cardiometabolic. Mm-hmm. Those are the big ones, right? There's there's lots of other little things, but if you can kind of lump people into one of three categories. So I went down the autoimmune disease pathway. Right. My husband's family right. goes down the, the insulin resistance pathway because the body only has a certain number of responses it can make to stressors and toxins are extremely stressful, extremely inflammatory. And so over time, right, if you get one thing, it's probably not going to cause you to be insulin resistant. But if you're getting multiple times, now remember the toxins that you can't deal with are stored in your fat because they're fat soluble. That fat is angry fat. So it's not inert fat. It's angry fat. It's Mm pro-inflammatory. And when it's in your midsection, that's particularly inflammatory and alters the normal course of your blood sugar and its management. So Mm -hmm. it puts you at even more risk for blood sugar uh, malform and dysregulation. Dysregulation. Thank you. What word am I looking for? So, (laughs) so it's like a fat, a feed, a net, a feed forward that's inherently negative. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not in your favor, but it's a feed forward cycle that the more it happens, the more it happens and the more shut down you get and the worse it gets. Yeah. We talk about that inflammation kind of drives insulin resistance, which drives more inflammation, kind of that cycle that you were talking about. So it's really the inflammation. Um, And we talk about, you know, some seed oils and sugar. And would you think that people need to start thinking about toxins in the same way that we think about added sugar and like refined seed oils for, for inflammation, or maybe even on a, uh, depending on the person on a even more heightened importance like level of things. Yeah. That's such a great distinction, Morgan. So think about it. When I say toxins, it's really anything that your body has too much of that's causing dysfunction. So when I say toxins, most people are like, oh, I'm not sniffing paint fumes or huffing. I'm like, okay, of course you're not. Right. We haven't done that since we were kids. And then they took it off the market. So that's not how it is. It's really, it could be as straightforward as the food you're eating. And mm-hmm. the way it's it's in, interacting with your body and what it's doing to your epigenetics and your, if you're the person who's going to walk down that insulin resistance pathway and you eat a lot of, you know, added sugar, inflammatory foods, processed foods, seed oils. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to show up like that. Right. So mm-hmm. food is absolutely a toxin, especially if you so too think much. of it. Yeah. As a toxin, not necessarily separate entities, but it yes. can be in and of itself. What are some of the most common toxins that you experience with your clientele too, aside from maybe some of those specific food toxins? Okay. I think, so I always think it's useful to talk about and think about this as a framework. So mm-hmm. there's the toxins that we put into our body deliberately. So those are the foods. That's where the food comes up and the quality of food. Is it organic? Is it local? Is it processed? Is there added sugar? Are there seed oils? Is it rancid? Right. Yeah. 
so all of those things, that also is a category that we look at. What are we drinking? Water, air and water quality is implicated with about one in six deaths. That was according to a 1989 Massachusetts study. 1989. We're talking almost, what, almost 40 years ago, right? So yeah. it's only gotten worse. So what we're drinking and also what we're drinking that those liquids in. So alcohol mm-hmm. is intrinsically inflammatory. It's a straight up toxin. Uh, women don't tend to process it as well. And so we cannot keep up with our male friends, partners, spouses. It's, you know, it's not a one for one. It's like an eighth to one. So we need to be drinking a lot less because it throws off our hormone balance, our gut function. It's, it's creates leaky gut. It's really pretty nasty for us. So the, the category of what's going in our body, are we drinking from single use plastic water bottles that are endocrine disrupting? A lot of things in that. Then what's going on in our body, right? As women, we get ready, we put on all of this hair product to keep our hair tame, and then we put on makeup and we wear clothes that came from the dry cleaner. We, we're wearing things that are not clean and, and putting it on our body and the lotion and you know it goes on and on. By the time we leave the house, we've been exposed, or even by the time we walk to our desk, we've yeah. been exposed to 250 chemicals. And a lot of them are forever chemicals, which are endocrine disrupting. Okay. What are, no, 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 not too fast, but just what are forever chemicals that you said? Yeah. uh, So PFAS is one of the forever chemicals and there's a ton of them. It's, it's actually a category and these chemicals don't degrade. They just hang out and they hang out in our bodies. They hang out in the environment, the soil, our foods, our tampons, they're everywhere. It's creepy. They're everywhere. Um, uh, coated, coated cooking so that it's, Mm -hmm. so that it's nonstick there. It's really everywhere. And so the things we're putting on our body alter our ability to balance our hormones, sleep properly, decrease our risk of insulin resistance. Like it really does impact us. Yeah. And then the third category is, I'll say the other, it's, it's everything around us, our air quality, our furniture, you know, vegan leather's really in, but vegan leather is plastic. Vegan leather is not leather, it's plastic. Mm-hmm. And so we're sitting on plastic, which is an endocrine disruptor. We're breathing in fumes, chemicals. If, you know, my, I have a relative who bought a house on a golf course and they were so excited. Right. They were like, I bought a house on the golf course. I'm like, huh, congratulations. But golf courses love monoculture, meaning all the grass looks the same. It's nice and green. There's no weeds. Nature hates monoculture. Nature likes abundance and diversity. So in order to get nature not to do what it wants to do, you have to spray the living daylights out of it with glyphosate so that it it is monoculture. And so when you live near a golf course, a farm, an industrial plant, a highway, you're getting all of the airborne toxicants that are being sprayed or driven, you know, as the cars drive, they, they aerosolize these microplastic pieces from the tires, plus Mm -hmm. the smog, plus, you know, so there's just a lot of layers here. That's that other category, the bed you're sleeping on, there can be uh, flame retardants in your bed. Now, if you're a smoker and you live in a row house, you need flame retardants in your bed, Mm -hmm. but the majority of us, that's not pertinent. We no longer live in the inner city where there's, you know, a thousand people on a block. And if one person's house goes up, everything goes up. It's not really like that any longer. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason flame retardants are a problem is guess what? They're endocrine disrupting. So that means particularly the thyroid, it really messes up the thyroid. So will you just elaborate real quick, endocrine disrupting? Cause you know, we talk about that a lot, but what exactly like, does that mean for someone Mm -hmm. they when they hear endocrine disrupting chemicals or substance, what does that mean exactly? Sure. Well, let's talk about what's your endocrine system. Mm-hmm. Your endocrine system is your brain, your thyroid, your parathyroid, your um, thymus, which actually degenerates by the time you're like six months old, your adrenal glands, which are these tiny little glands above your kidneys, and uh, then your female or male hormones. Okay. Would you consider fat tissue to be part of that endocrine system? Because that's a, like, it's, it's, I'd say it's a driver. It's not part of the system, it, but it is an influencer. Okay. It's a powerful, very foul, follow, high follower influencer, but <laughs> it's follow- not a micro influencer. It's a major influencer. <laughs> has um, 2 million followers on YouTube. Exactly. It's a major whatever. influencer, but it's not technically part of the system. It's just okay. something that'll drive the system off the cliff. Okay. So, 
when you think of the system, and I always think of it linearly because it goes from your brain into your gonads, which are your female or male reproductive organs. So they all influence each other. So think of it like if you're female and you had a lot of stress and then you're like, wait, my period was due, but it didn't come. Am I pregnant? You're not pregnant. It's simply that you didn't ovulate that month because your adrenals were saying to your ovaries, hey guys, you know, look, a lion's going to chase us. We really don't need to be ovulating at this moment. What we need is to survive. So if you ever go into survival, your body knows more than you do that it needs to survive. Not You're not in a place where you can thrive and ovulate. So everything in the system has positive and negative feedback loops on each other. So now a stress, for example, is an endocrine disrupting event. Okay. But these chemicals look like our hormones and they act like our hormones and they bind to the same binder, uh, same receptors as our hormones. And we process them the same way which means that say you have a hundred dollars worth of, of endocrine substance to process, and now you have $250 to process. That sounds good, right? You're like, oh, I have more money. No. Okay. Let's think of it like debt, actually not positive. You have a hundred dollars of debt and now you have $250 in debt. You're not psyched. You're like, mm, now I got to climb out of that hole. So what it does is it piles on levels of toxins that we, that our body thinks is something that it should be in our body, except we know we need to process it. And then that just gums up the works. Mm-hmm. So it can throw off your thyroid. You're all, you're, it's very stressful for the adrenals. It can throw off your female hormone. So it really, it really just compounds and, and um, it's like circling the drain. So yeah. just- and I think just to highlight that menstrual cycle for women who still have one is it. Um, Cynthia Thurlow says it's like the fifth vital sign, you know, mm-hmm. and she's not the only person that says that, but you, you were describing me, uh, quite a bit last year. I think there were four times where I went to the store, I bought a pregnancy test, yeah. like my period's late again, yeah. what's happening. And, um, that was really the impetus for me to, to eliminate pretty much eliminate caffeine from my diet. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, I'm, I'm really doing my mindfulness work. I am really trying to strike that like elusive work-life balance. I feel Mm -hmm. like my nutrition and my exercise and my sleep are finally better. You know, we have two children, they were sleeping and I'm like, okay, there is a, yeah, finally (laughs) there's a stressor here and it's caffeine. And I think part of it is just really getting honest and curious with ourselves on what could be going on. So I just didn't want people to overlook that. Like if you're missing periods, if your periods are delayed, that means that that's a sign that something may be going on. At least it was for my life. And so I think that's a really, like a really interesting segue into, you don't know this about me. We are moving to the farm in two months. So (laughs) an organic farm or not organic? No, no. Um, so yeah, you guys should have seen your face if we're on YouTube. And so, uh, when Dr. Kozlowski was on here a few months ago, I said, okay, how can I best prepare? So our home was built in 1930. So we're a fourth generation farming family. Okay. Her eyes get wider with everything. No, I'm like, well, there's lead in the paint. So old how I'm like, oh, and it probably has a, an unfinished basement, which means oh. it's probably wet. And <laughs> so here's what we did. We did mold testing on all three levels that came back actually fine. There was more, more mold outside the house than inside. So it's a super tight build. Um, but yeah, plaster lathe walls. So probably some lead paint, I don't know, underneath all the layers of paint. Uh, we did water testing because they're the original pipes. So I was concerned after my conversation with Dr. Koslowski about lead heavy metal. Yeah. All that came back good. Um, so we're testing radon. Is there any other thing? And you, you mentioned monoculture. So it's a big acreage, lots of vegetation surrounding the farmhouse. We have a farm. Um, <laughs> I say a farm. A, a, we have farming land that surrounds us. Okay. It's either corn or soybeans. We don't have any livestock besides some random cats that like to roam around. Right. They don't count. So we have a garden which is, I would consider organic. Um, what else do we need to be considering here? Because yeah, this is such a great question. Okay. So let's, I didn't totally answer your question before Morgan. So let me back into your, the answer. Okay. Because once you've gotten to, okay, here's the three ways that you can get exposed to toxins. There are three major categories of toxins. Okay. There's heavy metals, Mm -hmm. that's lead, mercury, thallium, arsenic, cadmium. Uh, lead and mercury are the two that we really pay attention to. So lead is you get 50% of what your mom had when she 
for mm-hmm. you. You get it from lead pipes. Uh, it sits in your bones. So if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, you want to look for lead. Mercury, fish, fillings, uh, high fructose corn syrup, because they use mercury to process the corn, to go from corn into corn syrup. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's pretty nasty, actually. And they use mercury in order to to, um, process it down. And if it's not organic corn, you're getting the glyphosate concentrated and the mercury processed in. Great. So I wouldn't eat that. Um, And then... The second category is the mycotoxins, the mold you mentioned, and there's, you know, tons of strains. Those are from moldy buildings. 50% of buildings have been water damaged. Cars, dorms, schools. It's a really long list. And then the other, which is pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, gasoline, fumes, flame retardants, plastics, nail polish, beauty products. It's a huge list. So you're going to start to categorize, okay, where am I getting exposed? So there's, so the first thing I'm going to say is it can feel overwhelming, okay? And the, what I'll say is Rome wasn't built in a day. You're not going to be perfect. If you're human like me, you're going to screw it up. I have gotten greenwashed more times than I can tell you, okay? Right. And I, Doesn't that annoy you too? Uh, Just like, uh. It's good fodder for the podcasting where I go, oh, yeah. right? Like, don't do as your doctor did, okay? So, yeah. rem- but but remember to have a sense of humor about it, right? I was so psyched. I have four kids. And, and we, do you know how much laundry four children go through? God, like, first of all, God bless you. When I read your bio and like four kids, doctor, I don't know how it happened. Like kudos for you, but author, I'm like, wow, you know, that's amazing. So thank you. A lot of laundry laundry. though, a lot of laundry. So I was so psyched. I found this thing. It came in paper. So it wasn't a plastic bottle and it didn't have smells and perfumes and blah, blah, blah. I was all psyched. I'm like, cool. I'm buying it. I didn't just buy it. I bought a four month supply and put it on auto ship. Okay. So fast forward, we're like, the second or third delivery comes and I went, I never looked that up on my boyfriend, my favorite site, which is the environmental working group, which will tell me thumbs up, thumbs down, or kind of in the middle. So finally I was like, oh, daily and a dollar short, but I'm going to look it up. So I look it up and yeah, it's not, I, I try to aim for a, a certified by EWG or one, two or three. That's kind of my limit. This was like a six. And I went, oh, okay, we only have three months left. We're going to use it up and we're going to switch. So let's go. Now I'll finally answer your question, Morgan. What can you do? Okay. When you go back to this concept of the rain barrel and you think about all the things that fill up your rain barrel, what you want to do is pull off as many things that fill it up so you can deal with the exposures you don't have control over. Mm -hmm. Because yes, you want your kids playing outside. So in order to do that, you want to definitely don't spray your garden, but recognize that you're surrounded. You may get some drift of glyphosate Mm -hmm. from surrounding. You do what you can do, right? I would recommend you filter your water with the highest quality water filter you can afford so Mm -hmm. that you can pull out uh, chlorine. If the water is chlorinated, you can pull out particulate matter. You can pull out any contaminants, pull it out if possible. Filter your air inside your house. So that anytime it drifts into your house, you know, especially if they're spraying glyphosate, you're not getting that as you're breathing it. Okay. Uh, Make sure that all your beauty products, as you run out of beauty products, and this is for everyone, this is not only just you, this is all of us, right? So as you run out of something, that's when you go, okay, EWG, guide me. What should I go? Is, is what I'm using amazing or is there an opportunity to level up? And most of us have an opportunity. So one at a time though, it's not like, whoa, I use 50 products every morning and I got to fix them all. No, it's, it's as I run out of this, I'm going to then level up. Okay. So make sure all of your beauty products, your hair, our shampoo was the hardest thing for me to change because again, four children, do you know how much shampoo they use? Mm -hmm. I was like, it's really hard to get my head around how much that cost. And oh, I finally okay. did it, right? Like it's just expensive, but I finally did it. So it, it's it's leveling up as your budget allows and as you, your brain space allows, level up everything. Mm-hmm. Dishwashing detergent, the thing, what you clean your clothes with, your um, dryer sheets, your hair products, your food. So start to improve every level. And then what I say to people is, look, you're never going to be toxin free. You're never going to be toxin free. So don't try to be toxin free. What you want to do though, is decrease the body burden to a point where it doesn't cause disease. Mm -hmm. You've emptied your rain barrel enough that your body's like, yeah, I've got this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you maintain it. 
What's that? That's a really good um, question, but I have a great question. But before we get there, is there anything else specifically that you would recommend that we can, you know, look into to reduce toxin exposure before we increase toxin tolerance, which is kind of the next question. Mm, Okay. So I mean, you can also test, you know, if you work with a functional medicine provider, you can Mm -hmm. test for, Hey, what are my glyphosate levels? Mm -hmm. You can test. And what I would say is, especially if you're living on a farm, I would test it every year. Yeah. Uh, Glyphosate is actually readily water soluble. So it will come out. If you can stop filling the pump, it'll come out. That's the nice thing about it. When you, I don't know if you can ask, uh, answer this, but when I talk to my husband about it, you know, God bless him. I think everyone listening knows that I love him to pieces and I wouldn't trade him for the world. But when we talk about this and like, okay, you're spraying these chemicals on the crops and they're helping the crops grow. How are they not getting absorbed into the corn that the cow is eating that then we're eating? It is like, I know, but, but there's, and he's a smart guy too, but he says that they're, that they're not that big of a deal. And I think that a lot of people brush this off as, oh, we spray it on there, but it doesn't get into the plant. So, so it doesn't get into the plant, but it's on the plant. So will and, you kind of tease yeah, that so, out a little bit? Yeah. You, you know, you've just poked the bear just to let you know. I mean, I, I, I lecture on this. So, okay. So glyphosate is not directly toxic to humans, which doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, get rid of the glyphosate. Right. You know, I'm like, get rid of the glyphosate, but it's not directly toxic to us. What? So glyphosate impacts a pathway called the shikimate pathway. And the shikimate pathway is critical for beneficial bacteria uh, certain yeast strains, birds, insects, in order to create their essential amino acids or their amino acids. And the, and the glyphosate interrupts that pathway. So they cannot create their amino acids and they die. Now here's what the creepy part is. It doesn't impact us directly, except does increase our risk of uh, liver, liver cancer. But it's not like when you eat glyphosate, it messes up you, but it messes up. Here's the creepy part, Morgan. From your mouth to your anus, there that's technically outside your body. Okay. And we all think of it like it's inside uh, of us, but yeah. it's this tube that goes from your mouth to your anus and it's outside your body. But in that tube live billions of bacteria. And those bacteria determine whether you thrive or dive. Okay. And so the shikimate pathway is critical for the beneficial bacteria. But guess what? The nasty bacteria do not have the shikimate pathway. So when you eat food that has glyphosate in it, you're selecting out, you're killing off the good bacteria, throwing off the balance of bacteria in your gut and selecting for more harmful bacteria. That's just inside that tube outside your body and your body. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then what also happens in the soil, it alters the microbiome of the soil. Mm-hmm. And that means that the bugs get killed off. It's directly toxic to bees. And we know that bees are our pollinators. Mm-hmm. And without our pollinators, we have no food. And then it's toxic to birds, but again, only indirectly. It's not the birds don't get sick from the glyphosate. They die because their environment has been profoundly altered and the bugs they eat are dead. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what it's doing is it's causing this sort of avalanche of, of downstream effects that it may not get into the plant, but it's on the plant and we absorb it and we eat it. And it's causing all of these collateral damage issues that it can take years for glyphosate to get out of the soil. Yeah. That's, it's a really interesting topic. And my husband, we've looked into regenerative farming practices. We've kind of, he's read a really interesting book on, you know, dirt to soil. It's like, man, when you think about the type of agriculture that we do, and then you think about all the people in the world that do it. And then you think about, man, like what if we made like little changes, you know, what if we became a little bit more Mm -hmm. regenerative or sustainable? It's really interesting to think about because not everyone has the opportunity to do it. Not everything helps, right? Yeah. Everything has. So, so perfection is a myth Yeah. and everything you can do is impactful. Because yeah. the less the less harmful it is, the better it is. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge process to convert from spraying to regenerative farming. But well, I don't know if we ever would either. But it's interesting. But it's yeah, I mean, it's um, 
I think it's a huge challenge, you know, but I will say, you know, we converted our yard from kind of a, it was just a wasteland. It was just grass, you know, and we had kind of some flowers and some perennials that my mom had given us when we moved in. And about three years ago, I said to my husband, okay, it's time. We've been planning on moving and then we just couldn't get it together and it, nothing really was right. And finally I was like, okay, we're not moving. So we need to commit to our house. So over the last three years, we've spent, we've spent the time planting uh, hardy perennial fruits, bushes, vines. And so we have about, I don't know, 65 different plants on our property. It's not enough to feed four kids, just for the record. People are like, oh, you feed the kids. I'm like, no, we have a little, you know, you get five blueberries a day. That is not your antioxidant <laughs> quota for the day, but uh -huh. it's nice to go out in the garden and we're, har we're harvesting the Hascap right now, which is native blueberry, but we don't spray anything except for like garlic and tea tree oil. We spray things that repel the, the ticks and the, and the bugs, but we don't spray anything else. And, uh, I love seeing, I've counted like 12 different varieties of pollinators in my yard. Mm, cool. And our yard is the one that has the hummingbirds visit it and, and the butterflies. And, and so, you know, you do what you can do, right? Even if you say, okay, I'm going to convert an acre out of the 200 acres, everything is impactful, right? Like start to improve. And my mother-in-law has done such a great job on that, that stuff. Like she has so many varieties of plants around and yeah. fruit trees in her garden. And there are definitely pollinators around, but it'll be so fun for me. It'll be kind of like a new little hobby. I think that I develop um, yeah. around this. Um, I wanted to ask it's bug season. You brought up a great point. And the other night I was sitting out there and the bugs were getting me mm -hmm. and you know, we had off. And so I'm like, all right, here I go. Yeah. So tell me what I need to do next time. Like, what do I need to buy to keep the bugs off me? Cause they are bad in Nebraska. Okay. So, so here's the thing. There's a couple of layers. I live in Massachusetts where ticks are rampant. Mm -hmm. So if it's the, if it's the choice between get a tick and be chronically ill for the next 10 years until some doctor figures out that you have Lyme or wear clothing that's been infused with permethrin. So it's a little bit toxic for you, but it keeps the ticks off of you. I always opt for make a better choice, right? So you do your best with the information you have and you take into account what's, what are the options, right? So getting a tick and getting Lyme or tick-borne illness is devastating for a lot of people. So going yeah. back to the mosquitoes, if you live in an area and so getting bitten by a mosquito isn't such a big deal unless it's transmitting something. Right. Which it has in Nebraska. I yeah. work with people, you know, with yeah. West Nile or those kinds of things. So, uh, so there is one thing it's called don't bite me. I think it's still on the market. It's a patch. It's a, it's a B12 patch actually. It's all oh. it is. And oh. for some reason, if you're low in B12, the bugs like you and the, if you're higher in B12, they don't like you as much. I don't know if that's really true. Cause I was out on Sunday and I was like, wait, I got like four or five bug bites. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's a surefire way, but I wasn't wearing the patch. I just take a lot of B12. So, okay. So one, you start with that Two, uh, there are some frequencies that bugs don't like. So you can invest in like backyard fre frequencies that drives the bugs away and it works in, in a certain radius. Now you have yeah. a big yard. Like my yard is, my yard is probably the size of your front porch. And so it's not, it's tiny is what I'm yeah. talking, you know, it's like very small. And so, so that would work for us. That might not work for you. Although if you're sitting at the, at the, you know, the fire pit and you're sitting in the couches, maybe you just need to get that area and the bugs can be outside your bubble. So yeah. that's an option, permethrin infused clothing, um, bug tents. And then really as a, if you need it, you use the D, but those are the days you want to say, okay, I'm going to make sure I eat super clean and I don't drink alcohol and I'm going to exercise and sweat or do a sauna or an Epsom salt bath. Like you're going to want to amp up your detox when you know you're getting an exposure. I think the sauna actually, I have a, I have a wonderful question to kind of round out the interview, but before we get there, I wanted to ask about the sauna. Do you have a sauna? Um, do you use a sauna? Can you explain the benefits of sauna use? Cause, um, one of my husband's aunt and uncles lives, uh, listens to the podcast and they just got a sauna and they really like it. And so I wanted to hear your opinion on that. I have a sauna. I love my sauna. I use my sauna. And whenever I use my sauna, I use niacin to help open up the blood vessels and help detox. And I almost inevitably have a niacin flush that I'm always posting about like, oh, here we go again. Why am I doing this to myself? It's because it's good for me. And I'm in the sauna anyway, so I might as well be, you know, super hot. So um, 
So the, the sauna, if it's uh, near mid, far infrared, can get deep into the tissues and support at a cellular level, the tissues releasing toxins. Because you release toxins when you sweat, it also helps the body to get rid of things right through the skin. It's mm-hmm. your largest organ. So you can easily get rid of toxins. So I'm a huge fan of t- saunas. And my response to people is like, what should I buy? Well, yeah. buy the best in class for what your budget allows. So okay. if your budget allows for a sauna blanket, research and find the best in class sauna blanket. If you can get the portable collapsible one, get the one that has less PVC. So you're not breathing in the PVC. And if you can get best in class near mid far, I would say that's a sunlight and sauna. And um, that's near mid far and it's got red light therapy with it. And it's just fantastic. But do your best in the budget you have. Is that stuff in your book? Like those? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm actually really excited to read your book. Um, I just horrifying Morgan. Well, I'm sure, but I kind of like that. Uh, I like a good challenge. I just finished um, Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia, and that one was a deep, dense read, and it was a really nice one to, I'll reread it, but like it helped me optimize my exercise program. And so I'm going to read yours and kind of like think about that as we move to the farm and how can we optimize? I'm very excited for that. Um, So one more question that I think that we can chew on for a little bit that I loved was just explaining the you know, differences between persistent infection or like the link differences, however you want to say it, her persistent infections, diseases, and then environmental factors. So I think sometimes when you're having chronic illness type symptoms, it can be so hard to tease out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I'm like a black and white human. So my, my (laughs) response to almost everyone is if you have anything, anything, headaches, hair loss, brain fog, anxiety, depression, acne, thyroid issues over or under asthma or any other respiratory issue, frequent illnesses, immune suppression, cancer, degenerative disease, autoimmune disease, diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, bad periods, heavy periods, endometriosis, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, whatever, you name it, too thin, too fat, I don't care what it is, you've got toxins because we are living in this unremitting exposure. It's really, you know, we we create thousands of new chemicals every year and the EPA does not regulate them. The EPA only looks at them when the company says, hey, I think this might be toxic and then re- self-refers, but who's going to self-refer? That's like yeah. a death sentence for your business. So mm-hmm. we're, we're getting exposures that are just everywhere. So what you want to take do is take a step back and say, okay, if I'm peak, optimally, functionally healthy, then you can literally ignore this podcast unless you're interested in prevention, right? If you right. never want to be. All are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you if you have anything that you have that you're suffering with, you want to look at toxins because they're so inflammatory at their nature and inflammation breeds breeds breakdown. And you're going to show up with your breakdown in the way that your body is prone to. So again, I did autoimmune. My husband does diabetes. Your family maybe do something else. So you're going to go down that, that toxins pathway, whatever you're prone to, you know, your, your manifestation. Mm -hmm. So when you look at immune function, toxins are absolutely playing a role because this constant unremitting exposure challenges the immune system and then it gets less efficient and then we get sick more often. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's just critical to, to include this in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times when people come to me um, or as if we, they're very focused on food and exercise, and then we introduce sleep and we introduce stress and toxins as a type of stress on the body. So I'm so glad that you brought this conversation to the forefront with your book. Um, I want, I have actually one more question. You said that your next book is on kind of gracefully transitioning from the reproductive years to menopause. Why is that a passion of yours? And why did you decide (laughs) to write a second book on that topic? Yeah. Well, I mean, apparently my husband was like, honey, it's all about you. And I was like, apparently, um, about two years, I'm 52 and a half. And about two years ago, I was really in the throes of the perimenopausal, nosedive. And I was sitting in the car. It was a beautiful summer day. And I'm sitting in the car. All of my kids are in the car, which means I have to watch my mouth. And 
the car is not on Morgan. And my husband's like puttering around, getting stuff in and blah, 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 and talking to our babysitter and this and that. And I'm roasting. We're waiting to leave. I'm roasting in the car and I have a hot flash. So now not only is it hot, I'm having a hot flash. And he poked his head in and he asked me something. And I I was like the exorcist mom. And I was like, do you value your life? Turn on the car. And he was like, whoa. I mean, he took a look at me and I was like bright red and dripping sweat and like evil. So he turns on the air. We start driving. We get the kids settled. You know, we turn a movie on because I'm going to turn a movie on because I have something to say. So we turn on the movie. The kids are occupied. And then I can actually come out with and I go, I am so sweaty and bitchy. (laughs) <laughs> and we're writing that book next. And he's like, and we hadn't even published Dirty Girl yet. And he was like, can we please publish Dirty Girl? I'm like, yes, but then we're writing Sweaty and Bitchy. So then- that's um, that's the, why we wrote that book because I've essentially done all the things you shouldn't do. And now that I've done all the things you shouldn't do, I can give you a roadmap on how to, how to, how to have an amazing transition, how mm-hmm. to do this in a way that you're like, wow, I preserved my brain, my body, my relationships, my, my sex drive, how I feel in my body, all of it, because I went through it. So I did all the mistakes. You don't have to. Mm-hmm. That's going to be an exciting week. So hopefully we can have you back on the podcast um, when that book is ready. To, that'd be awesome. I've really enjoyed this conversation today. Um, I have so many off- authors on the podcast and I read most of their books, or at least I get a copy and skim through it, but I am really excited to read yours. Um, and yours is going to be a hard copy. So usually I do audiobook. And then if I really like it, I'll do Kindle. But when I want my husband to read something, I'll get the hard copy. So because it'll be kind of, I think that this is a partner conversation. You know, if I'm suggesting new laundry detergent, or if I'm suggesting new dishwasher detergent or whatever the the recommendations are, I like to have that evidence for him to see. Mm -hmm. And it's just so much easier to do that with the hard, with the hard copy. So um, where can we learn more about you and get your book and all that good stuff? Tons of places. So we have, we have a bricks and mortar called five journeys.com. That's for people who are like, Oh, I got to be a patient. Yeah. That's a small number. Right. And then there's people who are like, I want to participate in some way, but I live in Nebraska or I live in Iowa or I live in California. So we have an online brand called dirty girl detox, where we have programs, community, you can do a test plus a consult. We have supplements. So we have an ability to start joining the community in a way that's meaningful for you. So that's dirtygoldetox.com. And then the book, you can get the book there, but you can also get the book off of Amazon. I recommend if you're going to get the book that you type in Dirty Girl Detox Trubo, not just Dirty Girl Book, because you oh. can get like stuff that doesn't pertain to this. And then it'll be in your your search, right? Like things you recently searched and be like, and you're you going to be yeah. like, why is Google showing me that? Right. So search just add girl. my name, <laughs> add my name or add detox. Make sure, you, make sure you really specify you want the book on the roadmap to clean up your life and feel freaking amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm really excited for all of that. We'll link up all those resources and it was great to talk with you today. You too, Morgan. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. Bye.